Hello and welcome to our podcast, Pager. I'm George Milner. And I'm Stan Dale. Tune in to hear us talk with some amazing people about the subjects changing medicine today. In this episode, we focus on what the COVID-19 outbreak means for general practice in the UK. To do this, we're kindly joined by Professor Helen Stokes Lampard, former chair of the Royal College of GPs and soon to be chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. She heads up the National Academy for Social Prescribing and at the heart of it all is a practising GP near Birmingham. From consultations via video link and infection control in surgeries, how have practices been turned upside down by the current pandemic and how are they adapting? We also delve into the importance of social prescribing, testing for COVID-19, mounting pressures on healthcare staff and finally difficult conversations surrounding end-of-life care in the current crisis. Enjoy the episode and do check out part two on what COVID-19 could mean for the future of general practice. Helen, welcome on the show today. Thanks so much for joining me. Such a pleasure. Thanks, George. So uh, we're talking right now remotely amidst the lockdown of the UK with lots of media focus kind of squarely on hospitals and intensive care. But I'd just like to ask you to start off, why is general practice as important as ever in current times? Oh, goodness. And um- Every single day, over a million people are making contact with their general practitioner, with their surgery, and are needing care from us in myriad ways. And it's really easy to get caught up in the excitement of uh, the media coverage around COVID-19 and all the focus on providing a huge expansion in the number of intensive care beds that we have in the UK. But every patient starts their journey at home. They start their journey uh, in the community and most of them will have contact with primary care and general practice. Um, And of course, the vast, vast majority of patients with COVID-19 will never present to hospital or intensive care mercifully. And GPs and their teams up and down the country are working their socks off to radically change what we're doing, the ways we work, to adapt, just as the whole NHS is. Um, But also to try and you know, deal with some of the really difficult questions that we're being faced about patients that we would otherwise have wanted to admit to hospital, but where the hospitals just simply won't be able to cope. Yes, I guess this is an even greater role from GPs. They've always been somewhat seen as kind of gatekeepers to secondary care, but we're seeing this kind of even more acutely as elective surgery has been cancelled around the country. Absolutely, you know, so so virtually all elective surgery is gone. Um, Many routine outpatient stuff has been suspended. So, you know, dermatological services, audiology services, physiotherapy services are being paused. And of course, all these people have still got the same clinical need they had a month, you know, a month ago. Um, And so their need for good general practice is going up and up at a time when, of course, we just like everybody else are seeing our staff numbers decimated um, and the services we can provide changing. But what I love about the NHS and the people who work within it is this incredible spirit of get pulling together to get stuff done uh, and that's just as true in general practice as it is in larger settings like so how would you say that your practice as a GP has changed therefore following the COVID-19 outbreak gosh well the, as things started to uh, emerge a few weeks ago we had to rethink fairly quickly our practice of seeing nearly all patients face to face you know big I, I'm I am part of a large general practice. We are responsible for almost 30,000 patients. We have about 100 staff and we work out of a large community health centre, which has a lot of different services and a pharmacy and so based there. And suddenly realising that it was no longer safe to be bringing patients to the building, that we, not just for our protection, but for the protection of patients, uh, we're going to have to suddenly think differently. Uh, so we set up, um, you know, sort of emergency groups to start planning things differently. And one of the joys of general practices because we are relatively small businesses we can be very agile and if we decide to change something at five o'clock by six o'clock it's implemented um so you know if we suddenly say right we're closing the front doors and we're going to station a member of staff there to speak to people we just do it we don't have to go through committees and protocols um we move very swiftly to uh start doing more and more consulting remotely and certainly by now um All consultations with a GP or a nurse start with a telephone conversation. Um, Some are then converted to a video consultation. Some are then converted to a please come down. But when people come to the surgery, we're minimizing the time they're actually in the building. So um, even if somebody's coming down for a blood test, the forms are done in in advance. We, We know exactly what we're doing. So they come in the building very quickly, blood test and out, so allowing the staff time 
equipped for donning and removing of personal protective equipment. And for other things like warfarin management clinics or INR clinics, uh, we're doing them in the car park. So patients are told when to turn up. We telephone their mobile at the time of their appointment, check they're in the car park, go out, take the finger prick blood test, run in to the sample and the analyzer, run back out and tell them what their dosing is and off they drive. Uh, All of this minimizing uh, risk and contact time, maintaining as much of this social distance as humanly possible while still providing the best possible personalized care that we can. I think it's you know, the essence of general practice is this holistic personalized approach to care. And in our haste to comply with the very necessary requirements of this uh, deadly virus, uh, we, we cannot lose sight of the individual patient and their needs because we will have an ongoing relationship with these patients, God willing, for decades to come. Um, and if we lose that uh, in the short term, it may be very hard to get back. I guess this, uh, both the speed and the kind of holistic care for a patient is something that's kind of very special about general practice and kind of particularly special about general practice in in the UK, where actually kind of have this agility to perhaps kind of change your working model almost overnight. Yes, that's right. I mean, I've been stunned and incredibly impressed how quickly we've we've radically reformed our services. But in fairness, my secondary care colleagues are doing the same as well, speaking to people who have always done outpatient clinics um, and suddenly realising that they can do a huge amount over the telephone without actually seeing a patient. You know, we're taught from the earliest days of medical school that, you know, 90% of our diagnosis is in the history taking um, and the examination and the tests that we do for form a very small part of it well it's more true than ever now when it's all about the words um you know using audio consulting so telephone mostly um is incredibly convenient but you do lose some of your senses and i guess for all of us gps we're having to make sure that we're concentrating extra hard uh, while we're having these conversations we've all been doing a lot of telephone consulting but we've tended to reserve it for the more straightforward things now we're telephone consulting for the most sophisticated and nuanced of problems uh, which really means that you have to be 100 percent focused on the words you're, you're listening for more than the words that are coming out of somebody's mouth it's the pauses between them the hesitations the intonation yeah maybe a telephone consultation isn't just the words from a consultation face to face just transposed onto a telephone you're a kind of professor in uh, gp education so uh, always from that perspective what what sort of adjustments would you therefore make for a telephone consultation um, compared to one face to face or a video chat so well, well if we start you know the traditional consultation with my patients starts when i click on their electronic record, have a quick look at the summary of what's going on. And then I go out to the waiting room to call them in. So I see the way they're sitting in the waiting room. I see the way they get out of the chair, the way they move, how they interact with other people, whether they can hear me. You know, I'm assessing gait, I'm assessing cognition, I'm assessing balance, all in those, you know, those few seconds of the walk to the consulting room. I'm looking at their facial expression and their, uh, you know, do they look depressed or or myriad other things. Um, And of course, you've lost all that instantly sometimes the way patients smell do they smell musty do they smell of heavy cigarette smoke do they smell unwashed and you know so you lose all those things so if i haven't got those things down the telephone or the video consultation i'm having to work extra hard looking for other cues and i may have to ask more questions um if you've got the advantage of video consulting you're still only seeing the part of the patient that they choose for you to see whether usually their face it may be they're showing their rash but you might miss out on the bruises in unexpected places the uh, the suspicious mole that isn't concerning them but actually scares you as a clinician when you see it on their back that they've never noticed so we have to work extra hard we can't mitigate for everything i'm never going to be able to mitigate for the the suspicious mole on their back that they didn't even know was there um, but i can concentrate and think actually you your colouring looks a little bit strange. Have you noticed your skin has changed colour type questions to people and asking them to show me uh, their abdomen where things like jaundice are much easier to see than they are necessarily in the face. Um, So all those little things you have to be more vigilant about, asking more questions. um, And I think pausing more and listening. I mean, as a society, you know, we're very much attuned to filling the silences in conversation. Um, That's even more powerful when you're not seeing somebody. If you can see that somebody's fiddling or wringing their hands, the silences can go on a bit longer. But if you can't see any of it, the temptation to fill a silence on a telephone is is greater. We must resist that more and more. And does this 
now in particular kind of increase the pressing need for these longer consultations? It, it, ironically, it's 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 a mix because what you need right now is flexibility to have consultations whatever length they need to be. Uh, so because you've lost uh, the face-to-face element, you may be needing to ask a lot more questions. Ironically, patients are certainly at the moment, our impression is they're being more um, judicious in their use of the consultation experience. So they are focusing more on the medical things and they're talking to us less about the other elements of their lives. And sometimes we have to go looking to check in on the social and the psychological things. Uh, and people are focusing on the physical because of the narrative that is coming out about um, saving the NHS and, you know, conserving precious resource and I worry more about what patients don't tell me um, sometimes than what they do um, so much of good general practice is based on the patient who's on the way out through the door who's finally built up the trust to say something to you and it's the oh by the way doctor consultation and every one of us has experienced that and you don't get the by the way doctor if you're hanging up the telephone there isn't that moment of the consultation ramping down um, you know, the phone's cut off and that's it. Um, the other big challenges we're having at the moment is the continuity of care is getting sacrificed. So um, in most practices, the, the way they've gone to handle um, the situation is that all calls from patients are then somebody, a doctor or health, advanced, advanced nurse practitioner phones them back. Um, and whoever phones them back tries to deal with the problem. So patients who I very much regard as my patients, the complex long-term conditions that I've known for decades, suddenly other people are picking up calls from them and it's not efficient then for them to pass that over to me. They try to deal with it. Um, but of course, what may be lost is that when this situation changes and we move forward, uh, when I try to pick up the pieces, there may be big chunks that I've lost and that'll be slower and more difficult. Hmm. And what do you think could be done in general practice now, perhaps to kind of mitigate against this loss of uh, continuity of care that you're talking about? So I think having the narrative, so being mindful of it, um, encouraging colleagues to write, you know, comprehensive notes is helpful uh, so that we know really what's going on. Some people are used to writing in code. Uh, others write uh, essays. Uh, we want sort of succinct summaries that capture the important things, but the important things aren't always just straight medical facts it's sometimes it's the social things you know I do want to know that their sisters just died of COVID-19 I want to know that they're finding it incredibly stressful um, having the kids at home um, even though they might have phoned about their migraine that, that those social factors uh, matter um, so there's something about note keeping and communication between healthcare professionals and also with the patients sort of reminding them that this is not the way it's always going to be um, but I think there is something about Patients learning to work with the NHS in different ways too, and patients are historically uh, even more resistant than healthcare professionals are to change in working practices. I'd like to kind of touch upon another change that seems to be happening in general practice and across medicine, which is this kind of definition of what non-essential medical care is, where lots of things are being postponed, lots of things are being cancelled. So how do we exactly go about kind of defining what is non-essential medical care because it's almost seems quite counterintuitive for a moment almost all medical care if we're doing it therefore must be important yes absolutely i think it's i I think essential is is, um, very much in the eye of the beholder Um, i think urgency is probably a better way of describing it so um my brother is an audiologist um, so he spends his life helping people with their hearing young and old Um, if you ask anybody who has uh, rapid deterioration in their hearing uh, about the urgency of having that help having help with that they would rate that as incredibly high I don't know if you've ever had a nasty ear infection but if you go deaf in one or two ears uh, for a couple of days it is the most distressing and debilitating experience so I, I think you know so I think most audiology and hearing aid clinics have been regarded as non-essential and have been shut down, thereby releasing staff uh, to help in other areas of the NHS. And so it's an, it, the problem is the, the patients who are suffering uh, may feel very hard done by indeed. Um, but, but, you know, we can, we can see why that would be uh, regarded as non-urgent. Other areas where I have profound concern are change in practice relating to management of urgent potential cancer 
uh, referral. So cancer symptoms, we have a part, we have pathways in the UK that we call the two week wait pathways, whereby uh, if a general practitioner or other clinician in the community, indeed another clinician anywhere in the system, finds a, a symptom that they think is a red flag of a cancer, they can get a patient into a fast track path and the NHS commits to uh, making the first assessment of them within two weeks and sort of full treatment being commenced within 18 weeks and so on. And um, what we're hearing now is that up and down the country, patients are being told that, I'm sorry, the uh, two-week referral uh, pathways are being suspended and uh, go back to your GP or ask to be re-referred in three months if you've still got the problem. Now, that is so counterintuitive to the messages we've been putting out to patients for the last decade or so about cancer. Um and people are terrified. You know, if the GP has assessed them as as thinking we need to exclude cancer, the GP will have had a sensitive conversation with them about the potential of this being something nasty. And we have to spell out to people that it, we're, we're referring them to exclude cancer as a possibility. Um, so now they're sitting there for months on end thinking they're dying of cancer. Uh, and this is really quite difficult. And I, I think that's pretty urgent stuff to be sorted personally. But this isn't a national thing this is cases that are bouncing around and receiving quite a lot of uh, uh, press um, there are other issues with how we prioritize things that you know sort of intermediate urgency you know people with angina and chest pain and whether they're going to get their angiograms or not harm will eventually come the pathways we have and the speed at which we try and do things in the NHS were chosen for good reason but every crisis of this nature has consequences and every decision to postpone something has consequences. Um, patients waiting for orthopaedic surgery, like joint replacements, are pre frequently the first to have their surgery postponed and be pushed down the list. But that also can mean that for the individual, they're unable to function in society the way they otherwise would have been able to, which has a personal cost, a family cost and a society cost. It's all very difficult stuff. Ideally, you want every decision made on its own merits. The problem is at times of intense pressure, blanket decisions invariably get made. Yeah, I guess it's this balance between kind of treating and controlling COVID-19, which is obviously a huge public health concern around the country, and actually dealing with things that carry on going regardless of it. People still have strokes, they still have falls, they have other Absolutely. infections. And actually, it seems completely inappropriate that we would sacrifice our entire health system, but at the expense of dealing with other people's health in yeah, other, other areas without evidence. And I think, yeah, one thing I was perhaps thinking when I see the debate around this is that it seems to be quite vicious at times. People can be kind of very much shut down from the media when they suggest that actually the most extreme measures to combat COVID-19 are not necessarily the most beneficial ones. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on this. Uh, do you want to give me a specific example? What are you thinking? If we were just kind of uh, basing our what we do on a model of we want to minimise deaths and minimise infections, then we'd also say, okay, journalists aren't allowed out. You're only allowed as, uh, deliveries of kind of particularly essential food items. And we would shut down our kind of economy and lots of things that actually really contribute towards people's well-being in that respect. I guess we see the same thing in, in healthcare, where, as you kind of mentioned, you talked about your brother working as an audiologist. That's something that is very important to to a patient there are lots of people i think who turn around and say actually no covid is the only thing that matters that's right and these all of these are are judgments every every one of these things is a judgment and you know if we take the sort of the most extreme example we know how to get rid of COVID-19. We shut society down as much as possible. We minimise everything uh, in the way that they did in the Wuhan uh, province. Um, they, you know, it was absolutely um, enforced uh, military rule or it was the police, I think, might have done it there. Um, but anybody, any infringements were severely dealt with. Um, we live in the UK in a very liberal society. We were very much letting people do it their way. And I'm stunned by how well, by and large, people are um, adjusting. Uh, but it's a fine balance between how tight you go. So um, I went in my weekly run to the supermarket, I noted that um, there was quite a lot of wine back on the shelves. Um, 
And I note that our, uh, off licenses are permitted to be open at the present time, which is a bone of contention for some people. Um, whereas two weeks ago, there was no wine left in the supermarket. Um, this was not a personal disaster, but there were a lot of people looking very unhappy about it. And it was a really interesting one. You know, you cannot argue that wine is an essential to human uh, existence. But clearly, for a lot of people, it makes being stuck at home a bit happier uh, to have a glass of wine. Uh, you uh -huh. can say the same about flowers. Now, interestingly, there were plenty of flowers in the supermarkets a couple of weeks ago. And there were none there today. And obviously, the flower growers have been told they're non-essential. So we are not stocking flowers in the supermarket. Now, flowers make our homes beautiful, make people happy. Um, and are, are a lovely token that you can give somebody to say you're thinking of them. You can leave a bunch of flowers when you do the grocery shopping for the neighbour, which was precisely what I was looking for. So there are things here which, you know, everything has a, a cost or, a, 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 you know, a, an opportunity cost when you do or don't do it. But there is no doubt that, that the harder we come down on the social distancing measures, the better in terms of cracking this one, cracking the, the COVID problem. However, we do, if we are going to be socially distanced, it doesn't mean we have to be socially isolated. And what's really important is that we use alternative means of communication uh, with our friends, our neighbours, our communities, our loved ones. Um, one of my major roles is that I'm chair of the Academy of Social Prescribing. Um, and social prescribing is essentially um, providing all sorts of resources that improve people's health and well-being that are outside the scope of the NHS. That's a sort of generic way of thinking but it's so all the things that are good for you that the NHS doesn't provide so whether that's relating to advice and guidance services whether it's exercise and fitness and fresh air things whether it's arts and crafts it, the whole range of, of amazing things out there uh, that make people feel good now whilst you might not be able to get out and go for walks in the countryside you can certainly be talking on the phone to friends and colleagues you can be doing handcrafts and we're seeing the most amazing outpouring of creativity uh, that people are sharing on social media so socially isolated we can avoid but, but we absolutely have to stay socially distanced mm. and this it could be rather tricky actually for the people who are most at risk of kind of this epidemic of loneliness in the UK, lots of perhaps elderly people without relatives close by. How do we make sure that kind of this group in particular is involved, particularly when they might not necessarily be kind of as digitally proficient and the normal kind of ways in which they access social prescribing? might be slightly incompatible with a lockdown. Yeah, well, people, so people who were connected to social prescribing services prior to the lockdown, um, I think are probably in a good place because if they're known to a social prescriber, we've got this, our, our modest army of social prescribers, particularly in England, they've been funded by NHS England, but the four nations of the UK have different variants of the same thing. And social prescribers are just reaching out to people, they're telephoning them and just saying, look, are you okay? Is there anything I can do? Can we modify? I noticed you just started getting Getting involved in a choir clearly you can't go to the choir right now are there other things we can be doing to help you so social prescribers are really stepping up and doing great work right now but of course for many many people will not have ha had the opportunity of being connected to a social prescriber and this is where we're seeing amazing work going on in communities now a lot of leaflet dropping is happening at houses uh, that, you know we haven't used a lot of paper the last decade or so we've moved away from it but actually sticking a piece of paper through somebody's door saying hello we're here if you need help please call us um, is a is one way to get started on things there is a challenge however where you get some sort of rogues um, and con people trying to capitalize on this crisis and which is about the most despicable thing i can possibly think of but we are where we are um, but so i guess the using recognized groups and charities as a starting point is quite helpful because they have ethical frameworks they have people who have been dbs checked um reaching out so if you don't know the people you're getting help from then and you've got any choice in it then try and use groups that come under you know age uk or the red cross or reputable charities um it, it is a pretty safe way of going with all this in england because the government has set up a, an extremely vulnerable persons uh, service which is helpful the, the devolved nations are doing slightly different variants of that but all this dovetails in you know it's all very well the nhs working its socks off and providing ventilator beds but we're going to have people dying of starvation if somebody isn't getting their supermarket shopping in for them mm. that, that's something i kind of wanted to add that this is not just good for people's mm. kind of well-being it's good for their health as well it's been shown to social interactions have been shown to decrease mortality and morbidity 
Absolutely. And this is why there's been a huge interest in social prescribing over the last few years. Now, every good GP and will tell you that they've always had a notice board full of leaflets and things where they have used in being aware of local organizations they could link people to and I was sort of when um, the as the years went by and said I wasn't allowed to have a notice board with leaflets all over it I had to have a little black book where I kept all this information and then a database and um, what a social prescriber can do is is do far better than I ever could as a GP about having all this information at their fingertips to link people up specifically on the loneliness and social isolation thing I'm always very struck by the saying that uh, lonely you can be lonely in a crowded room loneliness is a subjective feeling it's how you feel it and it's not related to the number of people that speak to you or ping you a message every day it's related to how you feel about the quality of your social interaction um, whereas social isolation is something we can count so we can count the number of contacts a person has and there are many people who are socially isolated but are perfectly comfortable with it that they're quite happy to only have intermittent, intermittent contact with people um, a slightly flippant example but I'm married to uh, an engineer and he he is a proper Myers-Briggs introvert and if he doesn't speak to people from one day to the next that's okay he's quite comfortable whereas I'm a very social person I need a lot of contact um, and I feel quite frustrated and, and um, low if I don't have lots of social interaction uh, but of course you can get your interaction in many ways so what do people need? Not assuming everyone is the same. Human beings are very, very varied in what they need and want. And often it's the quality of the interaction. So a 10, 15 minute telephone call, which is not formal aid, but which is genuinely, how are you doing? How are you getting on? What made you, you know, what did you watch on TV last night? What made you laugh? Uh, can be very powerful. Um, perhaps moving on from, I guess, the morale of the kind of general population towards the morale in healthcare. How do you think kind of general practice and your colleagues are kind of dealing with the current situation? What's morale like? I would say morale is very mixed. Um, it feels like we, we, we sort of fluctuate between the high of amazing team working and really being proud of what we've pulled things together and turned things around and that we're still keeping the show on the road despite very high levels of absence, uh, some related to COVID-19 directly, but a lot of it related to uh, having to um, socially isolate, um, you know, for seven 14 days depending on whether we're sick or whether we're living with somebody with symptoms or you know so my colleagues who are pregnant colleagues whose kids have got illness or family have got illness or got vulnerable people and um, so high levels of sickness we're pulling together and we're proud of ourselves for doing it but then there is a real anxiety out there people are very anxious about supplies of or absence of personal protective equipment people are very anxious about what they're being asked to do and I think the fear of what's coming uh, you know we're speaking um, ahead of what is predicted to be the peak of the problems um, and knowing that it's hard already that it's only going to get worse before it starts to get better is scary um, what will we in general practice be asked to do you know will we be uh, asked to be at the bedside of people who are dying uh, without drugs without syringe drivers without the sort of nursing care that we would normally be used to having you know we like to pride ourselves on providing excellent end-of-life care to patients and I think we are all frightened of not being the doctors that we want to be to our patients um, and, we, and yet we're also what we very much don't want to do is to engender any sense of panic in our patients so it's that professionalism keeping it together uh, because our, that's what our patients need from us and for us more experienced doctors it's holding it together and being calm and professional because some of our newer colleagues are more overtly frightened um, and we need to be uh, the steady influence for them. Yeah, and I guess it must be kind of a horrible feeling that you are compromising on the care of your patients almost through no fault of your own. And perhaps this is all about working out what to do with the resources that you have, whether it's kind of personal protective equipment or length of consultations. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and what is happening is we're refining everything almost a daily basis. You know, I think when one of my colleagues suddenly realised that we haven't actually got that many syringe drivers in the community. We actually haven't got that many nurses who can use syringe drivers in the community. Um, and what are we going to do if you know, that there was a nice news that a whole heap of syringe drivers have been ordered, but there's a five week lead time on them. Well, the crisis is going to hit us long before then. We have COVID-19 in two of our nursing homes already. Um, so 
how are we going to do it? Actually, what we need immediately, the practical side was, right, we doctors need a list of drugs that we can prescribe and use that don't need a syringe driver. There are things that can be used sublingually. There are things that can be used through transdermal patches. You know, things that could be given orally, even to the most sick and frail. Fantastic. What have we got? Let's get it ready so that when the time comes, we have these resources to call upon at our disposal so that we can still provide the best possible care. I think that's the key thing is we desperately want to provide the best possible care despite whatever situation we have nationally. And do you think that the guidance that you're getting from the government or from the kind of Royal College of GPs is actually in tune with the reality of what is on the ground? Because it's all well and good explaining what gold standard best practice is but if it doesn't match the resources on the ground then it's rather useless in the moment yeah so so i guess there's two sides of the same coin i've been really impressed with what has come out of all sorts of bodies public health england government bodies royal colleges widely the bma the gmc cqc everybody sort of gets that we are in unprecedented times um the problem on the front line is often the pace that these things come out so uh, because To get difficult things right, uh, all these bodies have to put things through a certain amount of process and testing. Um, And so it it, it often feels like we're needing things a few days ahead of when they appear. Now, actually, that's fine because often we're starting to work things out for ourselves and then suddenly something better and more worked out appears or can be integrated. Um, So so mostly we're incredibly grateful for the phenomenal work that's being done by others. Um, But if if there are voids, we just fill them. General practice is very agile in that regard. You know, if we haven't got something, you know, we're full of bright, intelligent people with various different skills. And so somebody will step up and do it. So whether it was the formulary for, you know, in in the absence of a syringe driver, what can we do? You know, it's easier at a time like this to blame. I think blame is just wasted energy right now. We can, there'll be plenty of time when this is over for us to have post-mortems and learn lessons. Um, What we have to do right now is be doing the best we can where we're at, um, minimise the fretting and the stressing, uh, do the best, um, and then store up the issues for the future when we can try and disentangle it. But when we do come to the post-mortem stage, we must do so uh, remembering what it was really like and not putting some artificial tint on it and suggest that, you know, we could have done it better because there were easier ways to do things. We have to remember how difficult it actually was at the time. And the question I have leading on from this is, Do you feel that you and your colleagues are are making a compromise between your health and actually your work in these scenarios, particularly as things come to mind with uh, lack of personal protective equipment and things like that, which is, I guess, particularly pressing given there's research coming out linking the amount of virus that you're exposed to with the severity of symptoms? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, so, so the answer is yes, but the degree of it is variable. So, um, so in our own practice, we've said to people, people must try to take their annual leaves if you were due to have annual leave you try and take it yes we may call on you if we need you because we know nobody's going away on holiday right now um if things get really bad but don't automatically cancel leave and downtime because more than ever we need to be refreshed and reinvigorated um so there's that side of things and we know when the really bad crisis bit hits it will happen for a couple of weeks but we can all work full tilt for a couple of weeks um, I worry about people's mental health, and the anxiety, stress. You know, there are some people who get their anxiety and stress out by sharing it loudly and widely. And for other people, they bottle it up. So providing, you know, mutual support networks is really important. And sometimes I think it's important to have support networks that are just outside your immediate colleagues, uh, you know, friends in another practice, in another part of the country can be a very powerful source of support. Uh, But we can organise ourselves to do all that. Uh, Issues then relating to the environment in which we work. You know, so I'm lucky my own surgery was refurbished through last year. Um, If I'd been working in the surgery a year ago and this had happened, I would have had much more profound concerns about how we can sterilise surfaces and so on. Actually, now that's better. But of course, there'll be plenty of people working in GP practices that are entirely unsuitable for seeing patients with infectious diseases. Um, PPE is such a hot topic. I think there's not much we can add that hasn't been said in the media. You know, there hasn't been enough at the front line. Um, there have been supplies, but the, the supply chain and the distribution has been the, the fundamental issue. That's being clarified now. Um, we're minimising seeing patients. At the end of the day, doctors will put the care of their patient first. That is the oath we took. And we'll just wash our hands an awful lot afterwards. In equal magnitude in the media, there's this concern over lack of testing. And are you are you particularly noticing that 
uh, having effect on practice and what would kind of an increase in tests do for you as a practitioner? Well, it's been frustrating because so, I mean, there's, there's many levels of this one. So, so, so testing, if we focus first of all about diagnostic testing and then come on to antigen testing. So diagnostic testing. And I know that there are dozens and dozens of my patients who have COVID-19. I like diagnosing them. I'm putting them on the records, but they're not counted in any official statistics. Um, so it means we skew the statistics. It looks like the UK, um, and at the time we're speaking, has had sort of you know, in the order of 25,000 uh, cases with um, I don't know, 1,400 deaths. Well, that implies we've got a very high percentage death rate of COVID-19. The reality is the denominator um, is far, far larger. You know, there are tens of thousands more people with it than are recorded. But that is a, an issue in many, many other countries too. Um, so we've, you know, this this issue of only testing people once they were hospitalised, only testing people that were very, very sick in hospital and so on. Um, but it also leads to massive uncertainty because, you know, the if we take the six people that I diagnosed on the phone on Monday, I didn't see any of them. It wasn't necessary. None of them needed hospital admission. All of them are in households now with other people who are shut in for a fortnight. And in one household, the the, the patient wailed at me, but two of my you know, members of my family work in the NHS. I said, I'm sorry, they cannot go to work. We cannot take the risk of them passing it on to others. I told you in my own practice, we're about 10% staff absence related to this very issue. If we knew if they had had COVID-19, if we knew if their family members had had it, it would save a lot of this. But much, much more significant will be the um, antigen testing to see if people have had and are now immune to uh, COVID-19. So once we have a reliable test and do not have a reliable validated test as we speak, although the NHS has ordered millions of them for when they are ready, that'll be an absolute game changer. I know many of my colleagues who've probably had COVID-19 um, who are probably now immune. Uh, if they were definitely immune, that would just be fantastic because they would then be able to consult without fear. That, that fear would be lifted from them. They've survived it. They're fine. They haven't got the fear of coming down with it. They haven't got the fear of taking it home to their families. They haven't got the fear about PPE to the same extent that others have, although, of course, other infectious diseases still matter. It, it, it would release so many people who are in isolation um, to back into the workforce. It, you know, it, would, it would be a game changer. And I know that at least one hospital has overridden the 14 days kind of mandatory stay at home because of staff absence. Are there going to be any kind of compromises that uh, that need to be made? Obviously, it's ideal that we kind of show people who, are poten uh, who potentially could spread the infection to other people. But at the same time, if it's at the cost of services collapsing, then perhaps there might need to be risks taken. Yeah, I think that's a really, really difficult one. I'm pretty sure there won't be national guidance on it um, because, you know, the, the the best evidence we've got is that it can take up to 14, even 15 days for symptoms to appear. I mean, after 14 days, the odds of symptoms of COVID-19 appearing drop to about 1%. And, um, but, you know, the peak is still several days down the line. It is not a condition that suddenly appears a day or two after symptoms. So um, I'd be surprised if we rush into big changes there. And the big thing will be to try to mobilise all the other people that we can use, you know, the massive volunteer workforce and the staff that are being moved around the system to try and prop it all up. And, and it's at that point at which you say, yeah, absolutely, we have to prioritise the, acute, the acutely unwell patient at the expense of everything else. Uh, but, you know, bringing people back in uh, who could realistically be carriers of the disease is is very problematic. Do you think that it's becoming harder to have these conversations, very important conversations with patients surrounding end of life care and the potential risk of dying from COVID-19? Yes, in an ideal world, GPs like to have quite careful, controlled conversations with patients about what we call advanced care planning, sort of end of life care planning, the sort of difficult decisions that people need to make. And ideally, we want everybody to think ahead, um, and particularly people for whom, um, you know, it, the end of their life is more predictable. And the question that we, we ask ourselves is, would I be surprised if this patient died within the next six months? Yeah. So there are many people that we have as our patients that won't die within six months, but that if they, they did die, I wouldn't be shocked as a doctor. You know, particularly frail people, complex people, very, very elderly people with lots of comorbidities, all these things jumbled together. Um, but just to be clear, I have some patients in their late 90s who I would be very shocked if they died in the next six months. So just to contextualize that it's not about age but it is about the com 
complex interplay of lots of factors. Um, so advanced care planning is something that we've been trying to do increasingly over time. Suddenly, when you have a disease that is very ageist, you know, we know that COVID-19 is, hits uh, the older people very hard and people who are more frail with complex comorbidities very hard then it's accelerating the need to have conversations at a time where we can't have face-to-face -face contact with people. So the most complex and emotionally sensitive conversations should ideally be done face-to-face -face, and suddenly we can't do that. So we are faced with a dilemma of trying to remotely discuss with people or raise with people the, if you get very sick, what would you like to do uh, conversation. Now for people who are in care homes, um, frequently Good care homes have already started those conversations and recorded some patients' wishes, but the GP symptoms don't know this. So care homes and uh, GP surgeries working together can be helpful. Often there are families that are very good about having conversations within the family about this sort of thing. But of course, if we don't know it as healthcare professionals, it's not recorded, then it has no meaning to the NHS. So it's how we best communicate. So we are seeing a bit of a flurry of these conversations to be had, but they must always be personal. They must always be targeted to the individual um, and not done in any blanket way. And this is where a lot of fear and anxiety is coming out. And we've heard some horrid examples in the media recently of uh, what I would regard as uh, very suboptimal practice in terms of writing to patients sort of blanket letters and that's that's not helpful it, it it creates a huge amount of distress and anxiety it's difficult when to kind of have these conversations about palliative care and have them in perhaps in these cases and in enough depth that people actually kind of understand palliative care what it means what it doesn't mean absolutely incredibly difficult. I mean, these are the most sensitive of conversations and you can't use too much metaphor or euphemism. You do have to be quite explicit in what you say to people, albeit that you build up to it gently. Uh, and so it really isn't something that can be done in a rushed way. Um, and that makes it even harder to do at a time of crisis and pressure. And um, so when all this is over, if one of the things that may come out of all this is that we'll have opened up the national conversation about end of life care, um, what does it mean to reject invasive treatment? I mean, versus having, um, you know, compassionate care at the end of life. I mean, obviously all clinicians want there to be excellent palliative care services available. And I've had some really mature conversations with organisations like the British Geriatric Society who have a very uh, mature approach to all this and how they say, you know, they, they rarely encourage their patients to go for full-blown intensive care therapies because that frequently doesn't lead to good outcomes irrespective of the disease let alone a disease like COVID-19 that is particularly aggressive in the in the very elderly so there are conversations happening we must maintain um, ethical frameworks and standards we must keep our compassionate care for all our patients at the heart of all our decision making uh, but recognize the clinicians on the front line are being faced with difficult situations and the more we can do to help prepare for that uh, the better it will be yeah and we hear in the media shortage of ventilators and shortage of hospital resources so i imagine it's quite difficult to have these uh, these kind of conversations where people will perhaps naturally assume that this end of life care is about rationing of resources where even in a world with kind of unlimited healthcare resources these decisions can be absolutely in the best interests of a patient absolutely it's all about the capacity to benefit from these invasive treatments um you know if you have an, a terribly resource poor environment then there will be the rationing part of it but but that should always be secondary to the if you don't have capacity to benefit from a particular treatment then the treatment is futile uh, and therefore wasteful um uh, you know so you know, we see incredible scenes on our TVs about the Nightingale Hospital opening the Excel Centre and many other centres around the UK. Similarly, those are going to be full of intensive care beds. Uh, but what level of intensive care people get will, ver will need to vary quite rightly because some people just won't have the capacity to benefit from full-blown ventilation, for example. Yeah, and you'd, I guess you'd rather have NHS Nightingale empty than fill it full of patients who are not benefiting at all from it and are actually being harmed. Absolutely. And I think that might be a good point to end on for today. So Dr. Stokes Lampard, thanks so much for chatting with me. It's been a great conversation. Absolute pleasure, George. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Pager Podcast. If you've enjoyed it, then head to Spotify or iTunes to hear more. 
As ever, we'd love to hear what you think. Do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you have a moment, and you can also reach us via our website and our social media pages.